Let's jump right into it. Get your outlines out, whether it's electronic or the hard copy version. I want to look at the mission of Thrive Church. We've been going through this every week. I want you to say it out loud with me, okay? I know there's fill in the blanks, but you should know what those fill in the blanks are. You ready? Let's do this together. Here we go. To help people engage with God and others, to equip them to live fully alive in Jesus, and to empower them to go and share Jesus. It's really three statements, but really three simple words. Engage, equip, and empower. That's what God's called us to do. God's called us to love him and love people. And he's called us to get smart to get in to get equipped to get equipped to 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 live fully alive in Jesus and then go beyond the walls and the doors of this facility and share Jesus with other people. Last week we started looking at the mission statement and we talked about the engaged part. We said it to engage with God and to engage with others means we love God and we love others. Now it's easy to love God and it's easy to love some of the others. But we always have that few that are in our life that, God bless them, they're either dumber than dirt or whatever, but it's a struggle for us to love them. But God's called us to do that. We must really learn to love him. And you know what? When we learn to love him the way we should, it gets easier to love the people that God has put into our lives. Today, what we're going to do, We're going to talk about the second part, the second phrase, which is to equip them to live fully alive in Jesus, to equip folks to live fully alive in Jesus. And I figure, where do we start? And I was thinking about that this week. How do we start that process? And we got to figure out what it really means. So the first thing I want to do is is begin by looking at how God created you and me in the first place. And it's on PowerPoint only. It's not on your, in your outlines, but it'll be up on the screens. King David in Psalm 139 laid it out for every one of us. He says this, and I gave it to you in the New Century Version. It says, you made my whole being. He's talking to God. He says, you made my whole being. You formed me in my mother's womb. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you have done is wonderful. I know this full well. You saw my bones being formed as I took shape in my mother's body. When I was put there, you saw my body as it was formed. All the days planned for me were written in your book before I was one day old. God, your thoughts are precious to me. When you read that, when I think about it, it's amazing. It's amazing because I tell people all the time, if I was God, I'd have done it different. If I was God, I'd have rolled out human cookie dough and I'd have gone ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. No, I wouldn't. Have. I'd have got somebody else to go ka-chunk, 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 and we'd all be the same. It would be like an amazing picture of the stormtroopers from Star Wars. And you would just be obedient to my every command. And you do exact. But that's not what God did. The Bible says he made you and me unique. He made us complex. He made us special. But he made us different. Completely different from one another. That to me is amazing. And when you realize what that means and how God was able to do that. Wow. I mean, think about that. In fact, in fact, Paul even goes on to say in the New Testament something, one of my favorite verses, this is in the PowerPoint too. It's from the, the letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Another translation, Paul uses the term masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. And you know what? I believe so many people would be so better off if they actually believed that, if they actually grasped the fact that we are God's masterpiece. We're not ka-chunk, ka-chunk, cookie dough cut, right? We are 
a masterpiece. We are a work of fine art. We are amazing because God created each one of us that way. It says that we are his handiwork. And he created us to do good stuff. And he prepared stuff for us to do. That is just so cool to me. I, you know, the problem, though, I think many people don't do anything for God because they don't think they're good enough. They don't think they're important enough for him to pay any attention to them. And that verse should help people understand we are a masterpiece. Look at the person next to you and say, you're a masterpiece. <laughs> I believe, I believe also to help us understand this. You know, the Bible is a thread that's woven through from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And you can connect the dots all the way through. I believe that is the main reason Jesus chose the people he chose to be his disciples. Because they weren't nothing special. They were very insignificant people. You think about Peter, James, and John. They were fishermen. They stunk. They smelled like fish, you know. They were hard men, you know, with calluses on their hands, and they weren't wealthy. Their clothes were tattered and torn. They were nothing. They were insignificant people. But Jesus chose them to help us understand we can be something for Jesus. It doesn't matter who we are because we got to remember we're his masterpiece to start with. But that's why God chose them, I believe. These three guys, you, you know what they did? These guys were changed. These guys hung out with Jesus. These guys became equipped for ministry, just like God wants you and me to become equipped for ministry. And they, they were able to be equipped for ministry because they spent time with Jesus. They didn't just sing him every now and then say, hey, how you doing, Jesus? What's going on? You walked on water lately? You turned any water into wine lately? They didn't do that. They were with him every step of the way. They spent time with Jesus. And as a result, when Jesus left this planet, those insignificant fishermen reached the known world for Jesus. They did something amazing. And the same thing's true for us. I believe for you and me to accomplish the mission that God's given us, to engage with God, to equip people to be fully alive in Jesus, and to empower them to go, I believe we got to do the same things that the disciples did. I believe we got to get equipped. We need to be prepared, and we need to be able to share the gospel with the people that Jesus puts into our lives. But in order to do that, we got to spend time with him just like the disciples did. So in your outline, to become equipped, there's several things we got to do. So let's let's talk about those. The first thing we got to do is we must spend time with Jesus. That's what I've been saying. We got to spend time with Jesus. I mean, these guys, Peter, James, and John, when, when Jesus got done with them, they weren't the same people. When Jesus poured into them, they became totally different. In fact, to the place that they shocked the religious leaders of that day, they shocked the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, the, 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 the people who made the decisions for the for the, the the for everybody, for all the Jews. But they shocked them. In fact, look in Acts chapter four, verse 13. It says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. If you're taking notes, circle that phrase, ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. You understand that's what we are. We are ordinary people. We're ordinary men and women with no special training. So the question becomes, how can God use us then? Well, the same way he used them. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more God can equip you and me to be used by him. 
Look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I use this verse a lot in my sermons because I think it's so powerful. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. I don't like that part, do you? I'm good with what's true, but when I start realizing what's wrong with me, that just gets me all jacked up. Anyway, it corrects us when we're wrong. Again, I don't like that part either. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So in order to accomplish the equipping part of our mission, based on God's word, we got to get discipled. We got to become discipled. We've got to create for the folks who walk through the doors here at Thrive Church a, a good discipleship process that will enable everybody who comes here, no matter where they are in their walk with the Lord, enable everybody who comes here to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And I think about how do we do that? How do we actually do that? Well, certainly it can be done one on one. It's probably one of the best ways there is. For, for you know for just one-on-one -on -one kinds of things it can be done by coming to classes that we offer here at Thrive Church it can be done and this is a dream of mine I want to create uh, an ability to do online training that's available for anybody all the time all they got to do is go to the website click on it and they can watch videos and and learn some things about who they are and how to grow up in Jesus I hope Maybe I'm, maybe I'm dreaming, but I hope we can help people get equipped by my sermons. I, I'm hoping. Nobody said a word. Nobody laughed. I don't know. Whatever. And uh, certainly, you know, um, other things that we do here, like having our Thrive groups where people do life together. Another thing we can do to equip folks is to have them work together. So, wow, that brings me right into the second point. Number two, we must spend time with others. We got to spend time with others. Here we're talking about folks doing life together. Here we're talking about folks who are rolling up their sleeves and working together. Here we're talking about folks who are serving together. Here we're talking about folks that are becoming equipped by being with one another and, and folks that are jumping in and getting on serve teams and fun teams around here at Thrive Church. The Bible is so clear. Working together causes you and me to grow we end up around folks that are ahead of us in our walk with the Lord who've been walking with the Lord longer than we have and we also end up with folks who are not as far along on the journey as we are and so by being with folks we end up and have a tendency to grow look what Proverbs 27 17 says this is this is so true as iron sharpens iron so a friend sharpens a friend. As we work together, as we spend time together, we are going to grow together. And that's what God's called us to do. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. It is so important that we spend time together. That will help us grow. Now, I, I got to move on because the uh, clock is running and the clock is never my friend. Uh, let's keep on moving. In your outline, understanding the equipping process. You see, we are called to be different. We're not called to be the same people we were before we met Jesus. We're called to be different. We're called to start showing the character of Jesus in our lives. We're called to be more and more like him. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. It says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. 
See, a lot of people, a lot of people don't get this verse. A lot of people have the mindset that it's the pastor's responsibility to do all the ministry. It's the pastor who should be visiting the sick. It's the pastor should, who should be doing all the counseling. It's the pastor who should be on the street corner sharing the gospel with other people. And you know, that verse doesn't say that. That verse says, my responsibility is to train you to go do that stuff. But you know, we... We don't want to grow a lot of times. We don't want to do that. And for whatever reason, we feel like we can't witness. For whatever reason, we feel like we can't minister to people. So if we bring them to church, the preacher will witness to them. If we bring them to church, the preacher will lead them to Jesus. If we bring them to church, the preacher will, and you fill in the blank. Understand something. My role in this process is to help you do that stuff. Because you see, I'm just one person or our whole staff. We've got, I've got six pastors on staff. We're just six people. But they're in our database. There's 400 and some people that call themselves part of Thrive Church. I guarantee you that 400 and some people can do a whole lot more for Jesus than just the six pastors here can do. Our role is to equip you and your role is to equip someone else so when we work together then we carry out the mission to equip folks to be fully alive in Jesus it is so important God calls you and me to spiritual maturity and you know what it's just not a a coincidence that we just spent five weeks talking about being woke to his truth I told you in the last week of that series Spiritual wokeness is spiritual maturity. When we become woke to Jesus, we start to grow spiritually. It is so important for us to do that. God calls us to be spiritually mature. He wants us to grow. The problem is we often don't understand what it really means to be spiritually mature. We don't understand what it means to grow to spiritual maturity. So what I want to do in your outline, I want to break it down a little bit for you. I've listed some myths about being spiritually mature, about spiritual growth, and they're in your outline. The first one, there's a myth out there that says spiritual growth is automatic. That's not true, guys. Spiritual growth is a choice. We have to come to the place where we choose we want to grow. I mean, you can grow older without ever growing up. You know? And and physically, I plan to do that. When I'm 80 years old, I'm still going to act like a 20-year-old. Okay? I've made that choice. However, that isn't an acceptable choice in our spiritual walk. Okay? A lot of people grow old, and yet they're still mature spiritually age does not equate to spiritual maturity another myth is that spiritual growth is instant wow the moment you say jesus come into my life boom you got it all he imparts all the knowledge that's not true guys it's a gradual process the reality is there's no magic pill that's instantly going to turn you into some spiritual giant it just ain't gonna happen It's a process that begins the day you ask Jesus to come into your life, the day you establish a relationship with him. But it is a process that continues every single day, every single week, every single month, and every single year until you take your last breath on this planet. It is a process, and there's no shortcuts to it at all, okay? The third myth is that growth happens just by attending church. Gosh, I wish that was true. Man, I wish that was true because some people would be so mature if it only took spirit, uh, took attending church to do it. You know, you got to be developing habits. Some people think that the Christian life is just a series of meetings. Got to go to church on Sunday morning. I got to go to group during the week. I got to go to the prayer meeting they're going to hold on Wednesday night. I got to I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got listen, you can get so wrapped up in meetings that you miss the whole point. 
It's not a bunch of meetings. Jesus didn't say, I've come that you might have meetings. Did he? No. He said, I have come that you might have life. And life ends up at home. Life ends up at work. Life ends up in the neighborhood. Life ends up with family. And yeah, life ends up in the church too. But a lot of people don't have time for ministry because they're too busy going to meetings. Okay? The fourth one, the fourth myth is that growth happens by yourself. You know, one of my big pet peeves is when I hear people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. They're right. They're right. But they're sure not going to grow sitting at home. Okay? You're not going to do that. The fact of the matter is we need to grow with others. We need the people that God's placed in our lives. Other religions, though, teach that if you want to become the guru, that you got to get yourself alone on a on a top of a mountain somewhere, or you got to go join a monastery. And Jesus never said that. Jesus never said that. You know, if that were true, if Jesus had taught that, you'd have never seen him hanging out with people. Because you see, if we use Jesus as the example, and he's the standard, guys, he went to parties. He hung out with people. He did life with people. He got alone sometimes to pray, but he spent most of his time around other people. Loving God means loving your neighbor. we got to be with people. The fifth myth is that growth is measured by belief. I don't know where that came from. But I know a lot of people that believe a lot of stuff and they're spiritual. Little, little, little. I mean, they can believe all this stuff, but if they don't put into action, it doesn't matter. Growth is measured by behavior, I think. Just knowing a lot of Bible doesn't make you a spiritual giant. Just just because you know stuff doesn't make you smart either. I mean, I think a good measuring tool is this. You look at people, look at yourself too, look in the mirror. When it comes to belief, you only believe the parts of the Bible that you actually do. Think about that. You only believe the parts of the Bible that you actually do. You see, belief is one thing, yes, but behavior is essential. I mean, at one point in Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they came to him and they tried trying to trip him up and trap him and, and, and into a theological dispute. And Jesus responded, this isn't in your outline, Jesus responded by saying you are in error because you don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God. That's what he told the Pharisees. And that was like slapping him in the face because you understand we talked about what it meant to be a Pharisee when we were going through the life of Paul. In order to be a Pharisee, You had to memorize, not just know, you had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. You had to memorize that and be able to quote it from memory. And Jesus says, you're in error because you don't know the scripture. It's important, yes, to know what God's word says. But it is more important to do what God's word says. Knowing means more than head knowledge. You can know words and you can miss the power. You get down to, okay, well, how do you know that you've reached spiritual maturity? How do you know that you're a spiritually woke person? And I think the answer to that is really simple. The same way you know when a tree is mature. When a fruit tree matures, what does it do? Wow, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. When a tree matures, it bears fruit. When a Christian matures, they bear fruit. Okay? How do you know if you're spiritually woke? You got any fruit? That's the best measure of all 
Do you have any fruit? What I want to do in the time we have left, we don't have a lot of time, but what I want to do in the time we have left, I want to talk about the secret of bearing fruit because that's what you and I need to do. It, it, when we're equipping folks to live fully alive in Jesus, they got to be bearing fruit. These are the things that, that we want to do uh, to grow, okay? You, you need to understand them if you're going to become all that God wants you to be. And I believe everybody here wants to be all that God wants you to be. So the secrets to spiritual growth in your outline. The first one is this. Spiritual growth is planned. It's planned. It's intentional. There's a method to it. You know where you're going to go. Before you start, you know where you want to end up. It kind of reminds me of a, of a story I heard about this guy, middle-aged guy, single he decided he was going to splurge and, and go on one of those seven-day Caribbean cruises. So he gets his tickets and he gets on the ship. And on the first day of the cruise, he notices a very attractive middle-aged woman who appears to be single also on, on the cruise. And at one point, he walks by her on one of the decks. And she makes eye contact with him and she smiles. And he's like, wow, that's pretty cool. So that night at dinner, he finagles himself to be able to sit at the same table that she's at. And so as they're, they're eating dinner that night, they start having a little bit of conversation, and it keeps on going. And, and he at one point says, you have a beautiful smile. And she goes, excuse me? He said, I noticed you today as you were on the deck, and when you passed me, you had a very warm and inviting smile and, and so she heard that, and she smiled again, and she looked at him. She says, well, the reason I smiled at you like I did was because you have a striking resemblance to my second husband. And he went, second husband? She's been married. He says, D -d 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 second husband? Um, I, I don't mean to be forward, but how many times have you been married? And she said, Once. Some of you will get that during the game today. Okay. The fact is, she was intentional. She was already deciding where she needed to go, right? Spiritual growth is intentional. You have to make a choice to grow. I don't know how to say it any clearer than this. You are as close to Jesus as you choose to be. You are as close to Jesus as you choose to be. To be, if you're not growing spiritually, don't blame your wife, guys. If you're not going spiritually, don't blame your husband, wives. If you're not going spiritually, don't blame your parents. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame your job. Don't blame your busyness. If you don't feel close to God right now, guess what? He didn't move. You did. If you want to be a spiritual baby all of your life, that's your choice. We grow by making commitments. We grow by making decisions. We grow by being intentional. Now, this isn't in your outline, but I want to lay out for you what I think are some steps that people take towards spiritual growth. And, and uh, we all fall into one of these categories. And the first one... I'll call the crowd, okay? We're all a part of the crowd. I mean, it doesn't take much. I call it a crowd because if you look at us at, at Thrive Church, there's a lot of us at this level. People come to Thrive Church. They make a commitment to come on a regular basis to either the first service or the second service, and, and that's the crowd. And if that's who you are, I'm so glad you're here. But don't stay in the crowd. Move to the next level of commitment. And the next level is what I call the committed. And I love to see people go from the crowd to the committed. Because this is where you say, I'm going to do something besides come to church on Sunday morning. I'm going to take a class that the church is offering. 
you know. Um, I'm going to go to another event other than Sunday morning. I'm going to go to the trunk or treat on Halloween, or I'm going to do something else with the church. You've made a commitment to do something that extends beyond the Sunday morning crowd. It may mean that you're going to check out a Thrive group, and I would encourage everybody to do that. My understanding is about 10 to 15 percent of the folks who call Thrive Church their home are actually in a Thrive group. And that's sad. That's sad. And I know everybody's got the same excuse. I just don't have time, Pastor Steve. You don't understand. I got 18 kids, and they're all in different ball games and, and, and doing dance lessons and taking karate. And you just, I, I get it. You don't understand, Pastor Steve. I'm working 60 hours. So I get it. So are the people that are in Thrive groups. So are the people that are in Thrive groups. You want to grow, you need to be around people who are like-minded. You need to be around people who are on the same journey that you're on. Thrive Group is a great way to do that. As people grow, then they move on to the next level. And the third level of commitment is what I call the core. This is the core folks. These are folks who have moved from feeding themselves to now helping other people eat basically, okay? I mean, what I'm talking about is people who have grown past the crowd and, and, and grown past the committed, and now they're serving on a fun team on Sunday morning. They're helping out in our children's ministry. They're working in our technical arts. They're working in our, in our worship team. They're working uh, uh, behind the scenes out in the parking lot or wherever they are, but they've decided, I'm going to start serving, and they've gotten on a, on a fun team, and they're doing that. I got to tell you what, you don't understand how important the, the core folks are. We couldn't do Sunday morning the way we do it if it wasn't for them. You know, it's not just me getting up here and talking for 20 or 30 minutes. Well, I've never talked for 20 or 30 minutes, but it's not just that, okay? It's, it's the worship that happens before. It's all that stuff back there in the booth that has to happen that those people are way more smarter at than I would ever, ever be. And I wouldn't know how to do it if, if they weren't there. We're talking about the kids who love on your children so that you can be in here. We're talking about the folks that come in at 7, 7.30 in the morning and start making coffee so that when you get here, you can have a cup of coffee. We're talking about the people that put the flags out that say, welcome, worship with us. We're talking about the people who meet you in the parking lot when it's raining with an umbrella to help you get in without getting. We're talking about all that stuff that goes on. We're talking about the folks that work in our office that produce the bulletins that you have and the outlines that you have and the digital outlines that show up on you version. You know, that just doesn't pop up there. We have people who have to produce that stuff to make it happen. There's a lot of things going on to enable us to have Sunday morning like we have it. And you know what? There's always room for you on that team somewhere. If they didn't do their jobs, we couldn't be here. These people are faithful. These people have, have uh, gone past the committed stage. They are faithful, they are dependable, they're here. And there's another level even past that. That level is what I call the commissioned people. These are people who've really gotten a hold of God's plan for their life, and they are executing their plan. They found the area of service that, they, that they're working in, and they're doing it. And we as a church, we commission them to go out beyond the walls of this church to share the gospel of Jesus. It's so important. Now, where did I get this from? I, did, I can't take credit for it. I, some of you may have heard Pastor Jim in years past tell that same thing. He can't take credit for it either because it actually comes from Jesus. This is the way Jesus led his ministry. It was modeled by the life of Jesus. He started his ministry at the age of 30, and he only had three and a half years to get everybody prepared before he went back up to heaven. So when he started his ministry, he began by just asking some people to follow him. Just asking some people to follow him. And, and in fact, Andrew said, dude, where are you going? And Jesus said, come and see. Come and see. And so he began to follow. Others followed. That's that first level. 
They were just checking Jesus out. They didn't even know who he was, really. They didn't know if he was for real. Maybe you're here today just checking us out. Listen to me. You are welcome. That is so great that you're here. We are not. Ask, we don't ask people to stand up. We're not one of those churches that say, we got visitors here. You, stand up. What's your name? Where are you from? No. No. I can't believe the church ever adopted that model in the first place. That is just dumb. But no, we don't do that. Okay? But... People followed Jesus, checking him out. That was the first step. And over a period of time, some people grew committed to Jesus. Uh, They started to really like his teachings. And they started to say, this guy makes sense. And they started following him. But this this is also the point at which Jesus turned the heat up a little bit, you know. This is where he started to refine them a little bit and, and refine the idea of what it meant to be a follower of him. And, and this is where some people checked out, okay. And then we move into the commitment level. At several times in the Bible, it says that people who were following Jesus left him. And you read why? Because the teaching was too hard for them. In John's gospel, he says that um, they followed him. And and Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, it means you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh. That's kind of freaky. And a lot of people said, dude, I'm not into that. And they walked away when Jesus was talking metaphorically. John 6, 53. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. It says that many of his disciples, when Jesus said that, said that's too hard, and they turned away. Jesus was taking his followers through these stages of commitment, and literally he kept turning the heat up, and he kept making the requirements a little harder until he established a core. That core initially was 12 people, but over time it grew to 72 And some of these he eventually commissioned, and they went out, and they're the ones that change the world. If you're going to grow spiritually, you need to have a plan. I encourage you to consider where you are today and consider making the moves that will take you to where you want to be tomorrow. The second secret is this, number two, and I can't spend that much time on the rest of these. Spiritual growth is a process. It's incremental, like I said before. We grow by having a plan or a process, and, and, and our growth is incremental. And sometimes it's kind of like recovery in a way. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. A great place to begin the journey, like I said a few minutes ago, and I really believe this, is to get into a Thrive group. Get into a Thrive group. In group, we dive into God's word deeper, and we discuss what it means. And then we try to figure out how it applies to our lives as being parents or being grandparents. Another step in the process is to take classes. Now, I talked about that earlier, but I want to tell you guys something. We made a decision. It started with me. I shared it with our leadership team a couple of weeks ago. In our discipleship process... Next year, in 2022, every class we teach is going to line up to our mission. It's either going to be a class that helps us engage with God or others. It's going to be a class that's going to equip us to live fully in line with Jesus. Or it's going to be a class that's going to empower us to go and share Jesus. And I went through the stuff we have. And here's what I can tell you right now. We're going to teach five classes next year. There may be more than that. But we're definitely going to teach five classes next year. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself or our our staff pastors. And those classes are vital to your growth as a believer. They're vital to your life uh, growing spiritually mature. I can tell you right now, early in the year, we're going to teach Uh, what we call biblical foundations for life. We're calling it your biblical foundations for life. It's the basic stuff that every believer needs to know thoroughly and and understand it completely. I am going to teach, I'm going to reprise this. I haven't done it in a couple of three years now. I'm going to teach a class called the role of the Holy Spirit. 
And it is a powerful, powerful class that helps you understand Holy Spirit's role in your life, how to, how to gain Holy Spirit power in your life, and how to move in the mantle of that power. We're also going to be doing a class that we're calling Equipping for the Journey, the, the Learning the Ropes of Discipleship. And, and our staff pastor is going to teach that class. Again, it is a powerful class to equip us to be fully alive in Jesus. I am going to teach next year the niche class. We haven't done that in a couple of years. For those of you that may be new, niche is actually an acronym. that, And the class basically helps you figure out who you are. Helps you understand how God created you specifically. What spiritual gifts God has given you, what abilities God has given you, where you are in your walk with the Lord, your experience. And we'll put that all together and you're going to take a, a group of assessments that we're going to look at. And, and we're going to meet with you individually after that class and help you find a place that you fit based on the way God created you into ministry. And I tell you what, when you find out where you really fit in ministry... It changes everything. It changes everything. And we're also going to offer twice next year our Pathway to Partnership class uh, where you get to choose, do you want to be a partner with us here at Thrive Church? It is so important that we take spiritual growth as a process. I saw this, and I want to read this to you. It's a quote. Um, A.W. Tolzer, who is an amazing Bible scholar, pastor, author, magazine editor, Here's what he said. He said, think about people who find themselves in religious ruts. They discover a number of things about themselves. They will find that they are getting older, but not getting any holier. Time is their enemy, not their friend. The time they trust and look to is betraying them, for they often have said to themselves, the passing of time will help me. I know some good old saints, so as I get older, I'll get holier and better. Time will help me. Time will purify me. Time will revive me. They said that the year before last, and they said that the year before that. They weren't helped then. Time betrayed them. They were not any better last year than they had been the year before. In other words, we got to start the process. We can't wait. Time will betray you. Look what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day that when Christ Jesus returns. We all know that children grow through developmental stages. We got we got, we, we're doing the grandbaby thing now, like a lot of you guys are doing. And just because I'm the senior pastor, I can say this. Two of our grandbabies had birthdays. One's got a birthday today, Christopher, and Emmett had a birthday on Thursday. And our little baby, June, she's going to have a birthday next, next month. So here's the deal, though. Every one of those grandbabies are at a different place in their life. Little June, she's just now learning things that I don't know how she learned it. She can put her hand on her hip and she can tell you no faster than anything else in the world. But you know what? It was just a year ago she wasn't even walking yet. She won't talking. There's a developmental process that babies go through. First is they learn how to eat. Okay? And then they learn how to cry. And they learn how to sleep. And they learn how to eat. Then they learn how to poop. Then they learn how to eat. And it just goes on. But one day they learn how to talk. And their whole world changes. And then they learn how to walk and your whole world changes. Right? And then they grow up and get married and it starts all over and it's crazy. But the thing is, there's a process to it. And that's the same way it is with you and me as we grow. The same is true for us. We got to learn to eat. We got to learn to walk. We got to learn to talk. We got to learn all that stuff. The third secret is this, and I really got to hurry up. The third secret, spiritual growth is personal. It's individual, okay? What I mean by that is that your plan for spiritual growth is not the same plan as your next-door neighbor's plan for spiritual growth. Why? Because God made each one of us different. He made each one of us unique. He made each one of us amazing, complex. So, one size fits all for spiritual growth ain't never ever gonna happen. I mean, some people, some people 
grow because they have learning styles that are different. Some people grow because they can sit and listen. Some people grow because they got to see it happen. Some people grow uh, by doing. There's all kinds of ways, a lot of different learning styles. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, For God is working in you and giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Let's move on to the fourth secret because i got to wrap this up. Spiritual growth is practical. Now, what I mean by that is this. We grow by developing good habits. One of the goals of us here at Thrive Church is to help people develop good spiritual habits. They're called spiritual disciplines. One of the classes we're going to teach next year is specifically about that, okay? There, there, it's what do you do to grow? What kind of disciplines do you have to have in your life? Matthew chapter 7, verse 8 says, For everyone who asks does what? For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open. It is so important that we, that we have a plan that's practical for you and me. We grow best in community with other people. We've already said that. Community is essential for growth because it's all about the journey you and me are on. That's why we encourage people to be in small groups. That's why I'm pushing Thrive Groups like I am. Another thing you can do to really accelerate your growth is get an accountability partner. Somebody that's going to hold you accountable. I mean, if you want to go to the gym and work out, you need an accountability partner. Somebody that's going to say, come on, when you don't want to go. Same thing's true about spiritual growth. You need an accountability partner, somebody who's going to check up on you, somebody uh, who's going to be helping you when you don't really want to do it kind of thing. Let me ask you an honest question as we close. Does anybody here feel a little stagnant in your walk with the Lord? You feel like you're kind of stuck. Well, listen to me. Do you know what you really need? Here's the problem. A lot of times we get stuck because we're not giving, we're taking. We're taking a lot of stuff in, but we're not giving a lot of stuff out. Let me give you a really good example of that. In the Bible, there's two great bodies of water that we see over and over again in the Bible. One of them is, is the Sea of Galilee, and the other one of them is the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is brimming with life, all kinds of fish, all kinds of, of things that are going on in that body of water. But over in the Dead Sea, there ain't nothing happening, okay? In the Dead Sea, it's filled with salt, and it's filled with brine, and it's filled with minerals, and as a result, there's no life in the Dead Sea. The thing that's interesting is both of those bodies of water are connected by the Jordan River. You see, the Jordan River starts flowing up in the mountains, and it flows down to those bodies of water. The Sea of Galilee has an exit to the ocean. So there's stuff flowing in and then flowing out of the Sea of Galilee. Coming from the Jordan River, there's a whole bunch of stuff flowing into the Dead Sea. But there's nothing going out. And as a result, it's dead. You feel stagnant in your growth. Ask yourself, am I taking in as much as I'm giving out? Because if your input is greater than your output, you're going to start to get stagnant. Maturity is not an end to itself. Maturity is for ministry and for mission. So as we become spiritually mature, it is for us to go out, to give, to get to that third portion of our mission, which is what we're going to talk about next week. So back to our mission, we first got to engage with God. And we got to engage with his people. In other words, we got to love God and we got to love people. Second, we got to get equipped to go and share Jesus. We're called to carry out Jesus' great commission. 
which is to share the gospel literally to the ends of the earth. So my challenge for you this week is this. Honestly, look at where you are on your journey. Honestly, look where you are in your relationship with Jesus. And then take the next step, whatever that is. Take the next step. For some of you, it's getting in a group. For some of you, it's signing up for a class. For some of you, it's going out and serving somebody else. But make the commitment this morning to take the next step in your journey with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you're an amazing God and we love you. We pray, Father, every single day that you will help us, this collective group of people who love you, to accomplish the mission that you established this church for. Father, help us every single day to engage with you and to engage with the people that you've put in our life. We want to grow, Father. We don't want to be stagnant. We want to become spiritually mature and alive for you. So help us to become equipped. And then, Father, we also pray, Lord, that you empower us to go out and impact this community, this city, this state, and this nation for you. Help us to do that, Father. If you could take 12 ragtag, insignificant people and change the world, use us to change our world. In Jesus' name, amen.